Universities, like most large institutions, are steeped in tradition and slow to change. Students from times past would not find modern lecture halls and teaching methods so different from their own experiences. However, once in a while, someone challenges the status quo. This, as you know, is the uh, Youth Urban Agenda Convention. They reinvent the curriculum to better fit the students in the times in which they live. To talk to each other and to come to some conclusions about what are the most important things that people your age think ought to be done in government. I'm Dick Simpson. I've been involved in politics and political science for 30 years. As a practicing politician and as a professor of political science since 1967, I'm concerned about how we present politics and political science in the classroom. Professor Dick Simpson teaches politics at the University of Illinois, Chicago. In addition to being a classroom innovator recognized by students and colleagues for teaching excellence, Simpson has been an elected official, a candidate for Congress, and an advisor to mayors, senators, and even presidential candidates. His has been a career of academic achievement and personal political activism. Well, in 1967, I began teaching at my first job at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And the first year, I did what they told me to. I used a standard textbook. Uh, I presented the standard lecture and discussion at the end of the week. And I found I just didn't like it. I don't like what the textbooks present. I don't like how it organizes the courses. And so I agreed to continue teaching at least American government and politics if I could do it my own way. And the department said, sure, kid, you know, if you want to do it, you do it your way. You know, it didn't bother me that Dick was critical of Burns and Baldison and so forth. Uh, I was too, and, and the more one teaches out of these conventional texts, the, uh, the more disillusioned you get, or the, most, the bored you, more bored you get in, in looking at it. Um, and then Dick's comprehensive, you know, using film uh, and, and uh, getting students involved in field activities, using the city, for example. That's what I thought that the direction we should be going. So I began to experiment first with television and uh, film. We're talking about access, equal access to that very precious ballot. And Mr. Powell has for years been placing his favorites and his cronies at the top of the ballot. The law happens to say first come, first serve. But to Paul, that doesn't matter. I sure wouldn't want to... Uh put on somebody there first that I didn't know. I might be getting a communist or somebody that's against our form of government. I like we're to... playing it safe. I, I'm, I'm going to take care of people like uh, that, that I've known and the names that I knew and people that I felt like would make good candidates and would make good delegates to help rewrite our Constitution. This is no kid game rewriting the Constitution of the state of Illinois. The reason I did that is I wanted to get the students to empathetically identify with political actors. I wanted them to see that it's different if you're part of a revolution or if you're part of an election campaign or if you're part of a protest movement or if you're lobbying a congressman. How do people go about doing these things? How do people as public officials, what do they do? And so I wanted to let them through the film see that. Professor Simpson began his teaching career at a time when the nation was at war with enemies abroad and at war with conflicting ideas at home. I was concerned about the plight of the country. In fact, I had gotten my job at the University of Illinois, particularly to be in an American city where I might be of some use in changing the political direction. So in 1967, uh, I joined the Eugene McCarthy for President campaign. He was running against a seated president. It was an outsider's campaign, it was a grassroots campaign, 
It was starting at the bottom and trying to make a change. We made a slight miscalculation, thinking we would elect presidents first and work our way down to the local level, and we failed. But in the failing, we had a grand learning experience. I learned the craft of politics. I learned how you run uh, precinct work. I learned how you uh, shape issues. I learned how you raise money. I learned how you do all the things that are necessary to a political campaign. Simpson grew up in a conservative middle-class Texas family with solid values of honesty, democracy, and justice. During his freshman year of college at Texas A&M, Dick became involved in the student YMCA. He grew to love the earnest give and take while discussing issues of the day. It wasn't until he listened on a car radio... To the candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. And he chose a political party identity. And uh, it was really hearing. I didn't see the makeup. I didn't see the, the shadows on Nixon. I was not impressed by visuals. I just heard the words that Kennedy spoke and Nixon spoke. And listening to the two of them uh, with no interruption, um, I decided, well, if this is what it means to be a Democrat, to be like Kennedy, and this is what it means to be a Republican like Nixon, I'll be a Democrat. And uh, uh, that really translated more broadly into I would be control concerned with the country and with social movements and with justice, uh, and I would do what I could to try and, uh, and uh, bring that about. That concern that commitment to social justice would later become the foundation of Simpson's teaching philosophy. I've uh, run internship programs where students work in campaigns or work for government officials or work for civic organizations or international agencies like Amnesty International, and they get to be a junior staff member. You know, maybe they're not going to be a campaign manager for the president, but they might well be an assistant to the fundraiser for the presidential campaign in Chicago. And over the years, through these variety of experiences, students have grown and learned in different ways in different classes. And they then take that that they've learned into the real world. Now, they may not all be U.S. senator. They may not all run for president. They may not serve on their city council. But anytime an issue hits their neighborhood, they know what to do about it. They know what their choices are. They know how to be a leader. My purpose has never been to train citizens. I figure anybody who can read a newspaper can learn enough to vote. But what I want to do is train political leaders who can give guidance, give leadership, and help organize democracy in the way it ought to be run. Simpson left Texas A&M for the University of Texas. He'd left behind the rigidity of a military school, but not the racial bigotry that prevailed across the state at that time. After I left A&M and went to the University of Texas, uh, I had been part of uh, interfaith groups uh, across campuses, part of the national YMCA, YWCA, and I just didn't believe in the segregation stuff anymore, and so I joined the Civil Rights Movement and became a part of that. Simpson went to Liberia in West Africa in 1965 to work with young Africans building a new YMCA. This exposure, coupled with his involvement with civil rights back in Texas, prompted him to choose graduate study of African politics at Indiana University, where he spent a summer training Peace Corps workers destined for Sierra Leone. In 1966, he returned to Africa to visit some of those Peace Corps volunteers. His experiences in Sierra Leone led to his dissertation, the political evolution of two African towns. I studied two towns uh, in different areas of the country. They were provincial capitals. And one had much higher level of social and economic development. The other had a much lower level of social and economic development. I mean things like uh, how much wealth was there in the town? Uh, how big was the town? What kind of school system did they have? And the better off town uh, had the less citizen participation, had the less voting, had the less involvement in the town council. Uh, and the other town that was poorer and had less good education facilities did better. And so what I came away with is the great lesson of my dissertation was that political history and political actions 
change politics. It's not simply the conditions of the society. It's not simply the school system. That we change our politics by what we do. And uh, that was, for me, a great insight. I uh, was studying two towns. I couldn't prove it in any political science definitive sense, but I found out what was really making politics work. And I brought that knowledge back to Chicago with me. I also discovered certain funny things that uh, you wouldn't think apply, but uh, in Africa there's a chieftain system. And the chief is a fat old man uh, with lots of food and many wives uh, with a good life. And everybody kowtows to him because he's powerful. Uh, and I found out when I got back to Chicago that nepotism and kinship and uh, the same kinds of things that drove traditional African politics drive Chicago politics. Uh, you wouldn't think that two places as different in culture and history, that would be true. But actually, I learned a lot of lessons in Africa that were very applicable to Chicago. Soon after he arrived in Chicago, he became involved in the Eugene McCarthy for President campaign. That unsuccessful effort thrust Simpson into grassroots Chicago politics. Simpson and his volunteers had won 40% of the vote for McCarthy in key wards. And that was where Dick Simpson was important. He became the key staff person in the Illinois state race in the presidential primary because what we were trying to do were elect delegates to the Democratic nominating convention who would vote for Gene McCarthy and against the Vietnamese War. McCarthy, of course, lost. Uh, we were disgruntled. I think almost all of us ended up voting for Humphrey as the lesser of two evils, but we certainly didn't get out on the streets and hustle. And Dick Simpson and a few of us said, what we have to do is set up a permanent, year-round, independent political activity based on the local precinct, which that's the name independent precinct organization, that's how it came about. All right, so if we are at the principle of having one major appearance at which we're trying to galvanize large numbers of people, make us a coherent... Dick was a fabulous leader for all of us. He wasn't the kind to sort of come out with us and drink all night. He was busy working on the thing. But as a result, you would have 200 people in a auditorium in a gym in DePaul ready to go out and work in an election because he would have gotten us to do the work to get them there. Through personal involvement, Dick Simpson was learning the craft of politics and acquiring an understanding of government that he had never learned in the classroom as a political science student. We went on from that beginning to fashion an independent politics uh, that changed the history of Chicago. I eventually ran myself for alderman. We eventually put together a platform that would be carried out by Mayor Harold Washington in 1983. It took us a couple of decades to accomplish our task, but we did transform the Chicago political history. To me, the most significant part of Dick's city council service was his use of the ward and ward politics as I'm sure what he would call a, a laboratory for democracy. Uh, Dick uh, was elected the term before me, so when I was elected, our wards are next to each other, we sit, sat, sat next to each other in the council chambers, I really, uh, Dick was one of the two or three main people that I looked to for leadership and, and mentoring and as an example. And my impression is that Dick came to elected office having been a person who studied politics, studied the philosophy, the practicalities of it, had some very well thought out and well grounded views about how government ought to work, at least at the local level, and wanted to put those concepts into practice. 44th Ward Fair is made possible by the fact that we have a ward assembly with delegates in every precinct, and we have delegates from every community organization virtually that exists in the ward. And As Simpson's real world political and life experience grew, he developed university courses to help his students understand how governments really function. And then you're going to have a chance to meet a series of government officials, campaign personnel, and a chance for some of you who are uh, in uh, particularly the 190 class 
uh, to actually work in some campaigns, some voter registration drives, and some lobbying efforts. Rather than simply introduce the students to the structures of government in the manner of typical high school civics classes, Simpson's new course was designed to provide a powerful introduction to the study of politics. I first, instead of writing a textbook in the normal sense, I wrote a workbook. And I wrote a workbook around multimedia. Uh, what I did was show films, show TV programs, uh, and I would uh, help them understand the TV programs. I would offer them uh, political philosophy, not by secondhand accounts of what Jefferson or Marx said, but by what Jefferson actually said and Marx actually said. And I would make them read these contradictory political philosophies. My point was not to make them either communist or Jeffersonians or agree with Ed Burke on, uh, uh, on conservatism or to agree with SDS that we needed uh, a revolutionary change in the United States today. I wanted them to take all of these ideas and come to their own conclusions. And if you force them into these kinds of conflicts, they have to. It's the same kind of thing when you go to the polls. If you have to choose between two candidates who are vigorously contesting different points of view, uh, then you have to make a real choice. If it doesn't matter and you just check off whatever the newspaper or the party precinct captain tell you, then you're not really participating in a meaningful way in the democratic process. So I, I wanted to introduce them to conflict because conflict is the heart and soul of politics. And once I switched to doing the study guides, uh, which eventually became a textbook called Who Rules, and once I switched to movies, once I switched to reading political philosophy, uh, I noticed that the evaluations went way up. In fact, as early as 1971, the students uh, in the university as a whole uh, voted to give me the Silver Circle Award in teaching, which is the most prestigious award which the students give to the faculty of the best teachers. I'll call that one to headquarters as another request. I will tell them when I'm in there, but I won't be in for two hours now. Okay. Because I've got to cover my own yeah, area. I mean, I mean, he was doing so I would Yeah. My principal focus in doing media projects, uh, films, television, uh, and the like, has been to focus on what are the conflicts and what do you actually do about them. And so I've tended to do uh, kind of cinema verite most often, where you actually see the people slugging it out in the precinct, going door to door, trying to convince the voters to vote for a candidate. Um, uh, you see the actual uh, effects of uh, the 1996 election uh, when Clinton was reelected and what that struggle was about at the presidential stage. Whatever level of politics and whichever style of politics, I've been interested in uh, the struggle for democracy and justice, and, but it really in the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, they're not particularly preachy. Uh, they're an attempt to see from the inside what is it like to be uh, someone involved in an election campaign? What is it like to be someone involved in a protest movement? Um, what are the issues of the day really about? Uh, why did uh, Clinton get reelected and why did Dole get defeated? Um, I want them to think about those things. Uh, the particular purpose in each course is slightly different and they get used in a variety of courses. Uh, but mostly it's, uh, it's to show politics from the inside so they have a feeling about the political process, the importance of the political process. They understand it's a fight. They understand how it is fought. Uh, and they understand they could go out and do it. Uh, there's no reason they couldn't work a precinct. There's no reason they couldn't be part of a protest demonstration. There's no reason they can't write a speech for a candidate. Uh, all of this is within their grasp, and the fact that their students doesn't excuse them from being Democrats in the sense of being participants in a democratic society. Politics is about people. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Uh, and so when, when you're able to see people in politics functioning and, and you see the personal stories and you see the struggles, you see the frustrations, you see the things that people like and they don't like, uh, that sort of, of class environment. Um, both when, when Dick Simpson would speak about experiences uh, or when he'd bring in uh, politicians or he'd bring in uh, campaign workers, he'd bring in people to, uh, to his other classes uh, or simply having students who are going through these experiences themselves uh, talk about that. That was incredibly valuable. Well, the first candidate to address you is State Senator Steve Rauschenberger who is running for U.S. Senate as a Republican candidate. Although a self-professed political liberal, Simpson has always worked to present different viewpoints in his films, videos, and in his classes. 
I was really uh, amazed, actually, at, at the way that, that Dick was able to balance the class. Uh, and, it, and it wasn't that he wasn't taking sides, because there's certainly, I mean, there's always an agenda in any class, in the way he presented material, in the order that he, he chose speakers to come in, um, the way he would challenge certain speakers or ask them to address certain issues. Um, so that was clear. I mean, that was completely evident. But he, he never made it as if we felt pressured to, to see things as he saw them. Um, he basically presented a side, a way of seeing the city, uh, and we were free to to take uh, the all of these different all of these different influences, all these different voices in the form of guest speakers, our own experiences, Dick Simpson's experiences, and we could synthesize them into our own understanding of, of Chicago politics, which is a pretty complex thing. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, the second highest ranking official in the state of Illinois. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Pat Quinn. Uh, Pat Quinn has been really an independent more than a party regular, even though he's been elected to state office twice. But I want to appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and thank uh, Dick Simpson uh, for letting me come and speak to you today. I'd like to make a little talk and then hopefully answer a lot of your questions and listen to your criticisms and suggestions. Uh, I am the Lieutenant Simpson Governor continued his elected, own struggle for political power in 1970 with the backing of the independent precinct organization which he had founded he ran for 44th Ward Alderman. Simpson won a clear victory and was re-elected four years later. Once in the city council Simpson's political role and visibility increased dramatically. Soon after he was elected Simpson rose in the council to question the appointment of Tom Keene, Jr. to the Zoning Board of Appeals. When the confirmation of Keene's son to the Zoning Board came up, Dick rose to speak against it. And one thing about the old-time machine guys is that you could say almost anything about an issue or about corruption in an abstract sense. But if you talked about somebody's son, they went crazy. This was interfering with family entitlements and so forth. And Dick was making what I think was a needed and legitimate speech about the lack of qualifications, the closed nature of the system and so forth. And Daly just went through the roof. And he rose, he didn't speak too often, but he did speak uh, to denounce Dick. And Dick tried to keep speaking, and there's a famous still photo, which I'm sure you've seen, it's all over the place, of two uh, uniformed officers trying to push Dick down into a seat. And Dick's a fairly large person. He wouldn't go down. I mean, it looks like a third world totalitarian operation going with uniformed people trying to silence the civil spokesman. Civilians Professor Simpson was and, not teaching uh, in the in classroom, but in the public arena where most sensible people did not dare to challenge Chicago's entrenched mayor and its machine politics. And so I objected, and I objected in a speech that was like two sentences long. I said something like, well, this seems to me to be a case of nepotism and a conflict of interest, and I don't think we should do this. And Mayor Daley exploded and said something like, well, uh, who's going to ask those questions? And I said, my students will. And uh, Daly didn't like that answer. And in between, we had the speeches of four or five aldermen uh, currying favor. Uh, they were praising how wonderful Tom Keene Jr. was and so forth. And after about five speeches or so, the mayor still wasn't satisfied. Nobody had put Simpson in his place. No one had proven that Tom Keene Jr. ought to be appointed in a case like this. And so the mayor tried himself. And the mayor read an absolutely dreadful poem um, called Sons, uh, written by Grace Noel Cowell, which I hope no one will ever have to read. Um, but it, essentially it says, if you can't put your arms around your son, you know, this is, you, you don't count. And um, uh, then the mayor went on after reading this dreadful poem uh, to explode in the most vituperative speech that he made in his entire very long and very powerful career. 
I think for many people of that era, that picture of Dick trying to be seated by the two police officers will be the way Dick is pictured and remembered. Having said that, that of course was his, one of his least substantively significant contributions because he had so many that were substantively significant. Drawing upon his own experiences, in 1972, Simpson published Winning Elections, a handbook in participatory politics. And it was not written just for the students in the classroom, although I used it as a text in the classroom sometimes. Uh, I wrote it because I wanted other people, other ordinary citizens, to know how to be engaged in a grassroots campaign uh, that could overturn even the worst political machines in the country. And uh, so we went through step by step. How do you choose a candidate? Uh, how do you raise the money? How do you get the volunteers? How do the volunteers proceed to register voters? How do they get their candidate on the ballot? How do they manage to win the election with the majority of votes? Uh, in the process. How do you design materials? Uh, we went through every step that's necessary to run a successful campaign. And that book came out in 1972. It's been in print consistently for 32 years. It has been the guidebook for candidates uh, running not only in Chicago, but for mayor and alderman and state legislature and school board across the country in little communities. It's also been used in presidential campaigns. The Chicago workers for John Kerry in the 2004 election used the winning elections book as a primer as they tried to go through the different tasks, even at the presidential campaign level. And the university became the benefactor of Simpson's involvement with Chicago and its government. As I went along, I continued to get awards both for teaching and continued to publish uh, at uh, a high level. Uh, the university, even about the publications, was a little nervous. They prefer the journal article uh, in the profession. Uh, it looks more scientific. It looks more official. And in the early years, I didn't bother to publish in the journals because I didn't read the damn things. They weren't interesting. Um, what I read was books and uh, articles in magazines and films and TV programs. And so I did most of my early publication in that venue. Uh, as I got more senior and had more time and was no longer uh, in uh, active public life, then I began to write the journal articles quite successfully. Simpson also had the time to bring his teaching to larger audiences through the public media. Miami has actually had their mayor go to jail along with a number of their city council members, probably a bigger average. We've only had 26 aldermen in the last 30 years go to jail. Miami hasn't had only that many, but, the but they have a He continues today to be a frequent guest on news and opinion programs. Professor Simpson has had the great satisfaction of seeing his students do well both in public life and academia. When former student Carol Mosley Braun announced her candidacy for president at the UIC campus, she singled out Simpson for his inspiration and guidance throughout her career. I started working with Dick on the Future of Chicago course and working with the speakers and seeing the impact that this actually had on the students enrolled in the course. And it was very eye-opening for me, and it made me want to pursue the possibility of a teaching career myself. And I kept work, working with Dick over the years um, as his teaching assistant as I went through graduate school, worked part-time as a part-time instructor at a variety of institutions, and now I'm a fully tenured instructor at the City Colleges of Chicago and really think that I made the, or the right choice in terms of my career that I'm not sure I would have had I not had that first opportunity to work with Dick with his uh, Chicago's Future course. If you're going to teach political science, I think you have to know political science and you have to, to be part of the political process. It doesn't mean you have to get elected to public office, but you have to actually go observe it. You can't just be a normal citizen. You've actually got to go see city council meetings. Um, you've got to take a position yourself on important issues to the community. Uh, you have to understand the workings from the inside. You can't do it all in an academic way or by giving statistics or crunching numbers. Uh, those come later once you understand uh, what's actually going on, and it's the understanding that's important. Political participation is an important learning process for you as well as for your students. I think also that uh, if you're going to teach this kind of stuff, you're really going to have to create your own materials. You're not going to find it in a standard textbook. 
Uh, and it's more than just adding uh, uh, some sort of anthology or reader to the course. Uh, you're gonna, you may not create movies, but you've got to create special exercises, you've got to create special occasions, you've got to expe create learning experiences. And I think that's important in thinking about how students learn. I don't think students learn so well just about reading it or hearing it in a lecture. I think you've got to put students into an experience themselves. Now they could come from watching a movie about how an election is conducted or a revolution is held. It could come from being part of studying uh, a local unit of government or observing a city council meeting or participating in an election campaign or undertaking an internship. There are a lot of different ways. But you somehow have to do that. The other thing is because politics is about conflict, I don't think you can teach this in a non-conflictual way. That is, what you want to present is the conflict. You want to have speakers from different points of view, or you want to read alternative political philosophies in the same class. You want students to have to choose between, to have to care about which side is right, and to have to come to their own conclusion. And if you're going to do all of this, uh, the university is going to have to recognize it. Have to recognize public service when you testify before a legislative committee and they pass a law has to recognize that the scholarship of engagement uh, where you really uncover how politics and government work is equally important as a journal article uh, that uh, you can get promoted and tenured uh, if you do your job well. Doesn't mean you can get by without publishing or teaching or doing public service. You've got to do all those things, but you've got to be able to do those in a way that's really engaged with true political life. Uh, not simply academic journals. And academic journals are important, but they're only important when they reflect the reality of politics. They're not important for their own sake. So we need to have much more flexibility in the university. We need to have rewards for different kinds of teachers doing a different kind of job. And I think new teachers have to learn you're going to have to find another way to teach. You can't just do the stand up and lecture, at least I can't. I think students get bored by that, but I can't do it in any case. I can give a great political speech, but I can't day after day give a compelling lecture. Some people can, but I don't think that's the main way that education pr proceeds. I think it proceeds from experience, from being engaged, from caring for material that's controversial, material that, that draws you in and that you care. And finally then, I think you have to have your own political philosophy. My political philosophy has to do with democracy and justice. I want to see us be the best democracy we can, and we are not. I want us to see us be the most just society we can be, and we are not. And so that drives a passion in my teaching that makes a difference in what I do and how I do it.